Hello, welcome all to this online immunometabolism series again. I'm happy to announce Professor Li Wu Li today. His group at Virginia Tech studies how molecular mechanisms control innate immune cells. And he studies this in different acute and chronic inflammatory diseases. Since a couple of years, he also, or his group got very interested in uh, innate immune memory or training. And today, Liwa will present their latest work on how innate immune memory controls uh, acute and chronic inflammatory diseases. As always, you can raise your questions via the chat and afterwards we'll come up to that. So uh, Liwa, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. I'm so, so, so pleased to have the opportunity to uh, present our work today. And again, thank you for organizing this very helpful seminar series. I got to learn a lot from the previous speakers. Just a brief introduction. I'm Li Wu Li, a professor of inflammation biology at Virginia Tech. We've been studying the emerging question of innate immune memory for quite a few years, um, uh, which will be the main topic for today's seminar. Uh, I will primarily discuss the general concept of innate immune memory dynamics. Uh, then instead of focusing one or two stories. Um, so as we learned in the past decade, um, so innate immune response is a, it, uh, acquires a, a dynamic memory state. So uh, this is, uh, so, so today's talk, I will fo primarily focus here on um, four or five areas. Number one, so what is the innate immune memory? What's the key mechanism that drives the innate memory state? Uh, in primarily, we'll use these uh, examples of uh, priming, tolerant, exhaustion dynamics of monocyte and neutrophils to illustrate the point of innate immune memory. Uh, in terms of translational significance, I'll be talking about this non-resolving inflammation in both acute and chronic disease, uh, in particular, cardiovascular atherosclerosis, and acute will be talking about sepsis. And, and then we'll be also talking about some uh, specific examples where we can intervene and resolve that inflammatory reactions in, um, in terms of therapeutic interventions. Uh, as we all know, uh, immune, immune response, there's a, two major arms. One is the acquired adaptive immune response. The other is innate immune response. So, so in order to maintain a robust immune response, we must possess several, car, so, several key features. So the key features of innate immune, of the, all the immune response, there are, there are four key features. Number one, we must maintain a complexity so that we'll be able to recognize diverse challenges surrounding us. And second, we must maintain uh, specificity so that we can recognize specific challenges both outside and within. Um, third, we must establish memory so we can remember the challenges we have been exposed to in the past. And then finally, we must be tolerant to ourselves. So those key features of immunity in the past decades or so, have been mainly assigned to the acquired immune system, uh, represented by the B cells and T cells, where they can recognize specific antigens so that they can uh, um, respond to a specific challenge and they can protect ourselves. And then the mechanism for maintaining or generating immune memory uh, are largely, we can summarize into two major uh, um, categories. Number one will be through this genetic recombination. We can, rec we can generate specific T cell receptors and B cell receptors, and then uh, we, can, we can respond to specific antigen challenges. And then we uh, will propagate the, the, the acquired immune memory through this clonal expansion. We can generate um, multiple uh, um, cells with identical T cell receptors or B cell receptors, we can produce antibodies against specific challenges. And based on the principle of the acquired immune responses, uh, indeed human are, are um, we, have, we have made enormous amount of advance in terms of uh, treatment. And these are the success stories. Uh, one of the success stories, of course, is the vaccine development. So based upon this fundamental principle of acquired immune memory concept, we can uh, generate um, specific vaccines so, so that we can educate and train our immune system to produce specific T cells and B cells. We can make specific antibodies to, to protect us through, uh, from those infectious 
challenges. And indeed, if you can see from this slide, uh, uh, from the review, we can see that the mortality uh, rate um, has drastically reduced from all kinds of infectious diseases, from um, tuberculosis, from uh, you know, measles and all the others, because of the discovery of vaccines based on the classical acquired immune memory concept. And that acquired immune concept is not only being used in the uh, practical application of vaccine development, but also in terms of cancer. So this is a, just a, a, a general slide, a, a story a while ago showing that uh, CAR T therapy developed by the Novartis based on, again, the same principle, acquired immune memory, where you can generate specific um, CAR T, engineered CAR T cells to target cancers. However, if we just solely depend upon the memory concept of acquired immune system, we have a bottleneck. Uh, uh, of course, we know that, uh, for example, with the emerging infectious diseases with particular relevance nowadays uh, with COVID-19. Uh, in the past, when I give a lecture about uh, this, this topic, I tend to say that uh, maybe some emerging diseases like Ebola or SARS, and for, for, but in case one day, the some infectious diseases, they're spreading so fast that uh, they are, the, 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 the rate of spread is more than the speed we can generate the effective vaccine, then our human race may be in danger. And then uh, we, we see some glimpse of that with the current COVID-19 case. Okay. So uh, same, same scenario, even with the tumors, even we are quite successful in generating CAR Ts, but with the rapid mutation of tumors, it'll be a challenge to, to keep up with the mutations of tumors. And likewise, there are many other chronic inflammatory diseases with multiple perturbations of antigens and challenges. So, so again, those are the limitations of using this, um, uh, well, um, using this adaptive immune memory state. So, and then, so that's the reason that we, we think that it's important to, to explore the other arm of immune response, which is the, this innate immune uh, state. The innate immune memory, innate immune uh, response, in the, in the previous uh, times, people thought the innate, innate immune response is basically basically the executioner of, uh, of the immune, immune arms. They take the command from the T cells and B cells and then simply execute uh, by, by phagocytosis, by killing, by eating, by moving around, uh, by um, uh, simply the, 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 the executioner of the immune response. And they may not, um, they, they only have limited uh, specificity. They may not have memory state. Uh, they're, they're not involved in the decision-making process. Um, but recently in the last decade or so, we start to realize that this is not the case. The innate immune cells, the, 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 the equally, um, they can adapt to the environment. They, they, they have specificity, they have complexity. They also have memory, memories. So based upon their, the nature and history of challenge, they can make, they can make rich repertoire decisions and as a res result, they can either choose to amplify the signal, execute, execute the command in totally different directions. For example, they can either eat, choose to eat or kill, or they can choose to communicate and repair, uh, or just choose to ignore the signal. So, so, the, so then the, that's why we see these uh, diverse functions of innate immune cells, for example, monocyte neutrophils. And, and then uh, they are involved in both the maintenance of homeostasis also involved in this cytokine storm, tissue damage, and, and, uh, and, and injury. So that's the case with the case of current COVID-19 case. So we know that uh, during this uh, COVID-19 infection, we see a rapid dysregulation of innate immune response, massive infiltration of monocytes, neutrophils, uh, degranulation, um, uh, net formation, and then, then causing this blockage of lung functions, not only in lung, but also in, in heart, in other organs. Uh, causing massive tissue damage. So, and if we can somehow better understand the memory state of innate immune cells, the modulation of innate uh, immune activation dynamics, perhaps we can better uh, maintain, better uh, intervene with this uh, acute and chronic disease. Um, and indeed, you can see that we just show some of the uh, main um, pictures that we took in the lab. See, this is the, this is the monocyte. Um, and then, um, 
we also have this uh, um, uh, neutral fuels polymorph PMNs with the multi lobe nucleus. They are the main responders to killing bacteria, phagocytosis in the bacteria. Once the phagocytosis and take out the bacteria, and then they can undergo um, degranulation, uh, uh, apoptosis, and eventually will be taken up. This dead uh, PMA will be taken up by the macrophages. So there's a highly ordered uh, interactions and communications between these this, uh, innate monocyte neutrophils in our immune defense. And as a proof of principle, so in the earlier days, Stephanie Vogel's group published paper in Nature uh, in, um, a couple of years ago. Uh, what they did was that they, they basically treat the mice with the mimetics of TR4 agonists, antagonists called eritorin. And after that, they infect the mice with, uh, with uh, influenza and other viruses as well. So what they show is that they can, so the application, the intervention of innate immune uh, responses can, can, can render a robust protection from influenza infection and possibly other infection as well. So, so that's, this is a proof of principle that uh, if we can better understand the regulation of innate immune memory dynamics, and then perhaps we can use that to intervene with multiple wide, wide ranges of viral or mi microbial infections without solely depending upon vaccine development. Um, so indeed, so it's, uh, indeed, uh, so this is this this field is emerging and exploding in the last uh, almost twenty years. Um, so there's several experimental system to understand and study the innate immune memory different activation uh, and differentiation dynamics. So I just want to go through some of the uh, uh, systems being available in the field. Uh, so, f so of course, everybody knows the M1, M2 paradigms of macrophages. Um, so this is the initial attempt in trying to understand the uh, distinct memory dynamics of innate uh, leukocytes. So what people did was basically challenge the innate immune cells with different agonists. For example, if, we, if they culture the cells with, in, with interferon gamma, and then that cells, that monocyte macrophage will primarily secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines um, in a state people define it as M1. And then if we challenge the cells with a different cytokine, for example, IL-4, the immune cells will be programmed into another state expressing arginase 1 and others, it's called M2. So even though this is a very highly artificial system, and we know that in, in, vi in vivo, it's a large, large spectrum of immune cells, innate immune cells that uh, adopt multiple state. But nevertheless, this is the first attempt that can give us a handle in, this, in understanding the distinct adaptation of innate immune cells. So that's the first system and widely used in the, in the, in the field. And then there's a second system that people study this innate immune memory dyna dynamics. That is, they will challenge the cells in combination with different stimulant. So there's, for example, there's two well examples. The first one is that uh, people, we can challenge the cell macrophage monocyte with, with beta glucan first. This is pioneered by Mihai Nantes group in Netherlands uh, uh, and others. And if you challenge the cells with, with beta glucan, and then after that, the cells will be, will be uh, getting a memory state and they will be hyper-responsive to the subsequent inflammatory challenges, for example, LPS and others. Mihai called that training. Um, um, so it's a, it's a memory state that the cells will be uh, memory. They, they will rem remember the prior, previous challenge. They've been challenged with another stimulant. And then there's an, another classical example similar to that, uh, long known to the, to the field for many, many years. That is, if we just give them a macrophage with LPS, the cell response will be real mild uh, in certain cases. But if you challenge them together with interferon gamma, uh, and then the, the response will be much more potent. So, so this is called cross-training, cross-memory. Basically, you, 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 the cells will be challenged with one stimulant, for example, interferon gamma first, and then the cells will, be, will, will adapt to memory state. They'll, be remem they'll remember that the cells have been pre previously been challenged, and then they will respond um, in a totally different fashion to a subsequent challenge. And then there's a third system. So this is the, this is the system that we've been working on in the last uh, almost uh, 15 or 20 years in the past. So we, 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 we hypothesize, we believe that uh, the innate immune cells 
not only can recognize distinct agonists, for example, interferon gamma, IL-4, beta-glucan, and others, but also they can also recognize the signal strength and history, meaning that even you simulate the cells with the same stimulant, for example, LPS or interferon gamma, depending upon the signal strength, the cell response will be totally different. So they will be programmed into a unique memory state depending upon the signal strength. And not only the signal strength, but also, but also the history. So if you stimulate them with one time versus multiple time challenge, then their response will be different as well. So there's a fine, finely regulated in, innate immune memory dynamics that can sense and detect the history and signal strength of, of the challenges. So, and then uh, our group and others have, have, have done that and demonstrate that uh, we use the classical example of endotoxin response. So the innate immune cell, for example, monocyte macrophages, they can respond to um, um, uh, the classical microbial LPS um, from the gram-negative bacteria cell wall, the lipopolysaccharide. LPS is the major component of gram-negative bacteria. Gram-negative bacteria coexist with humans from the beginning of human life. Um, 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 and then they, they uh, infiltrate almost all tissues and organs with, of course, with different concentrations on our skin and mucosal layers. We have track a lot of bacteria in the LPS, but in circulation, we have real minute concentrations uh, in, the, in the picogram promeal levels. Uh, but as we get old, uh, we age, we, we get, a, um, we get um, a diverse health conditions. There's a mucosal leakage, and then there's, a so there's a tiny increase of endotoxin levels in circulation in, in picogram promeal levels. So, and then our system have evolved at, in a fine sensing mechanism that we can sense and respond to distinct uh, concentration of LPS in different tissues and levels. Um, and then we, um, so uh, we call that uh, uh, priming or tolerance with a very low dose endotoxin. And then the cells will be programmed to, into, a, into a state, we call them primed state. Uh, with a much higher dose endotoxin, of course the initial uh, re reaction from the cell will be very robust. But afterwards, if we persistently stimulate the cells with high dose endotoxin, they will develop a, a, a state people call endotoxin tolerance. But if we keep on challenging the cells, then the cell will, will go to a state of, uh, called exhaustion. Uh, we, we mapped out and we try to understand the mechanism and implication of these dynamics in health and disease. Um, as I said that, so if we challenge the cells with high dose endotoxin, higher levels will say generally above 10 nanogram per meal um, in vitro. Um, and then their cells will elicit a role. Initially, we we'll have a robust pro and anti-inflammatory reactions. And subsequently, if you uh, persistently stimulate them, they will, uh, they will exhibit endotoxin tolerance and exhaustion phenotype. In contrast with super low dose endotoxin, uh, which is also a sub subclinical dosage, um, this is a subclinical super low dose that is highly relevant in physiological and patholo pathological levels in circulation, we experience a sustained uh, low-grade inflammatory expression of inflammatory mediators. i show some of the examples. So this is a, a, um, a report we published a couple of years ago in Journal of Pathology, where we, we take this bone marrow uh, primary monocyte from mice, and then we culture them in the presence of MCSF to maintain the survival. We culture them for five days. So at the, during this five-day culture, we repetitively uh, um, inoculate them with different dosage of endotoxin. And so here, if you look at CCR5 or IL-12, those are pro-inflammatory cytokines or mediators on cell surface. Uh, we see that if we, if we challenge them repetitively with higher dose endotoxin, above 10 nanogram per meal or one microgram per meal, we see that, uh, that the cells develop a, a tolerant state. Basically, there is no induction of CCR5 compared with cells without LPS or even perhaps a, a reduction in certain cases. In contrast, if we, stim if we repetitively stimulate the cells with super low dose endotoxin, which is a pathologically relevant dosages in the circulation, we start to see uh, a persistent induction of CCR5 on the cell surface and IL-12 expression in the cell. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at arsenase and INOS, it's totally opposite direction. 
So if we repetitively stimulate the cells with a higher dose of endotoxin for five days, the, we, the cells keep on inducing arsenic-1. The higher the, the endotoxin challenge, the higher the levels of arsenic-1 expression. Similarly with INOS. So we see a, a drastic induction of INOS. So uh, um, this is a system we've been using lately. So the persistent stimulation with either super low dose or higher dose of endotoxin. Uh, not only we, we can demonstrate that with the, uh, with the total population level, we can also do, for example, we can do this um, flow cytometry, looking at the percentage of cells expressing IL-12 or, um, or INOS. Uh, we have a similar scenario. With a lower dose of endotoxin, we start to see a higher population of cells expressing IL-12, but with increased endotoxin levels, we start to see the population of cells expressing IL-12 decrease. In contrast, the population of cells in expressing INOS will be keep increasing. Uh, and then uh, uh, we believe that within every single, the reason for doing so is because within every single cell, there's a fundamental motif. There's a two mutually competitive motif within every cell, uh, depending upon the concentration of the LPS. And then we, we can shift the balance either to one state to the, versus the other. Um, and then we also demonstrate that this not only occurs in, the, in mice cells, but also in, in primary human monocyte. So in this figure here, on, on, the, on the above, A and B, are the human, are the mouse monocyte. monocyte. And here uh, in this panel C is a human monocyte. This is a human primary blood monocyte from human healthy donors. Uh, again, in the human monocyte, there's three populations, the CD14 uh, high, CD16 low, and CD16 high, CD14 low, and CD14, CD16 double positive monocyte. And the, the double positive CD14, CD16 monocyte is believed to be the most uh, inflammatory um, uh, monocyte involved in uh, acute and chronic diseases. So, and if we incubate the human monocyte with rising dosage of endotoxin, we, we, we found that the human monocyte is much more sensitive to endotoxin. So we can see the expansion, expansion of, of this uh, CD14, CD16, and CC, CCR5 positive monocyte with five picogram per mil of LPS. But if we increase the LPS concentration, we start to see a reduction. Uh, if, uh, with a high, much higher dose with nan 10 nanogram per mil, we see almost complete uh, ablation of this uh, CD14, CD16 monocyte, uh, positive monocyte in, in human primary cultures. So and how, do we, how, how do we explain that? So what's the mechanism behind this, uh, this, uh, this memory? So if we go back to the fundamentals of, of the toll like receptor signaling, we know that uh, the cells have uh, pattern recognition receptors exemplified by the toll like receptor 4. And uh, I call that structure sensing. So the, the cells can recognize the, the nature, the biochemical nature of the stimulant through different toll like receptors. Like I said, the cells can not only recognize the, the biochemical nature of the stimulant, but also we can also recognize the, uh, the, the dosage and history. And I call that functional sensing. Right? So we can sense this, the dosage and history of LPS challenge. So the functional sensing uh, is, can, must depend upon not only the, the, the structural com compatibility between the, the ligand and the receptors, but also it requires the intracellular molecular motifs uh, with unique topologies. And that can uh, give rise to distinct state of activation, uh, differentiation, and, and, and exhaustion. So we defined a, 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 no, a, a novel motif through, through the, com through the uh, collaboration with computational biologists on campus. Uh, we believe that within each individual cell, uh, there is two competing forces that compete uh, uh, that try to compete with each other. In the meantime, they also listen to the same sti stimulant, for example, LPS. And depending upon the LPS concentration, they can shift the balance uh, toward one, uh, one arm versus the other. And as a consequence, we start to see the cell can, 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 can make a clear decision into one state versus the other. And of course, uh, during the competition process, the cells can also adapt, adopt into some uh, hybrid state 
we can start to see the rainbow effect. So from one extreme to the other. Um, and if we have additional signals, for example, if we add one, one or two more signals, and if we simulate the dynamics, we can see the cells can adapt at least a two dozen, more than, more than a dozen of different type of activation state, depending on the balances of, of, the, of the challenges. So, and then we, we, we further look at the, 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 the kinetics. So using flow cytometry, in this case, we use the MCP1, CCL2 as an example. So for example, if we challenge the cells, again, this is the murine monocyte, uh, stimulated in vitro with rising doses of endotoxin for five days. At the end of five days, if we let the competition uh, come to a steady state, uh, to completion, we see that with a very low dose endotoxin or with 100 picogram per meter LPS, the cells are largely, uh, most of them will be MCP1 positive, as shown here with the peak of the flow cytometry. Uh, com as compared with the cells without, without, MCP, without uh, LPS stimulations. Here, most of the cells will be MCP1 uh, positive. Uh, and then as we increase the concentration of LPS, we start to see the, the peaks shifting to the negative side. So we start to see the peaks shifting. Uh, with 100 uh, nanogram or one microgram per meal, the peaks shift to this uh, uh, MCP1 negative. So most of them will be MCP1 negative. Uh, only a, a small portion will be MCP1 positive. But if you look at day three, we'll see a totally, uh, uh, um, we'll see uh, uh, the, the competitive natures. So when at day three stimulation, we see again, um, um, the, the unique dynamics. For example, even with a high dose LPS, 10, 100 nanogram or one microgram LPS, we start to see two peaks instead of one peaks. By day five, when the, when the competition comes to the completion, uh, higher dose endotoxin primarily will not induce MCP1. But by day three, we start to see the cells are trying to make a decision. So we can see the cells, there's a the MCP1 positive peak and also MCP1 negative peak. So, so suggesting that, the, that, that within every single cell, that there's a decision to make whether they will be starting to make MCP1 positive or MCP1 negative or tolerant state. Um, so, and, and recently we also have done some uh, single cell analysis using Tinesh genomics uh, uh, approach. So, so we can see this uh, clear illustration of uh, the competition and the decision making of cells um, with, with, with low dose endotoxin stimulations. So the, the blue color with the PBS case, we can see that we, with, without LPS stimulation, most of the cells will be in the resting state. But there are some cells already being activated as shown here in the blue, blue colors. But with LPS, with the continuous stimulation with the super low dose endotoxin, we start to see the cells are shift to a, a, different, um, a different state. We use this UMAP analysis in, in st instead of this uh, T-SNE because the UMAP not only will give us this uh, two dimensional reduction uh, 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 um, and, then, and then we can cluster them in different space, but also the UMAP will also tell us the relative, uh, uh, relative distance between different populations. We can draw a pseudo time analysis to see where the cells are going, where, where they're coming from. So with, with super low dose endotoxin stimulation, we start to see the cells are primarily clustered over here, and, and also there's some minor clusters over here. And if we look further, we see that the genes within this majority of the clusters, they are representative of the genes, they are representative of the cells that express MCP1, express CD88, express the cells that are involved in the pro-inflammatory state, CCR2, CCR5, ICAM1, and all the SRA, so within this cell, these populations. But even with super low dose endotoxin, there's some, still some minor population of cells that are MCP1 negative, um, and, and they, they start to express uh, uh, these uh, tolerant genes and also exhaustive, exhaustive genes. So we define them either prime state or tolerant state or the exhaustive state. Uh, with particular um, interest, we saw that, that the, the exhaustive state, some of the exhaustive state contain the cells expressing genes um, uh, that, uh, that are reminiscent of the um, exhaustive monocyte occurring in sepsis. So for example, there's a recent nature immunology paper from the uh, MIT group showing that uh, uh, the exhaustive monocyte in human septic, septic patients, they express uh, molecules involved in 
immunosuppression and pathogenic inflammation. So for example, more, uh, they have increased expression of PD-L1, um, um, uh, increased expression of IL-2-RA and others. And we saw some of the signatures in, in those states as well. And we also further looked at some of the meta metabolic um, uh, genes. So we found that in a prime state, actually there is not much change in, in genes involved, uh, involved in uh, metabolism, in, in glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylations. In contrast, uh, only the tolerant state the, the, or the exhausted state where we see the massive uh, alteration in, in genes involved in PPP pathways and also in a, in, in a pathway involved in, in oxidative phosphorylations. Uh, we further confirmed that by doing this uh, seahorse assay, measuring this uh, um, uh, respiratory uh, oxygen consumption rate, we can see that uh, with uh, super low dose toxin, there's not much change, uh, alteration in, in general um, oxidative phosphorylations, um, oxygen consumptions, but also with, if we challenge the cells with high dose toxin persistently for five days, we have a drastic reduction of these um, uh, mitochondrial respirations. And then we look at, further look at the mechanism. So what's the competitive circuit in a cell that drive the clear de uh, decision making into one state versus the other? So we, first we look at some of the classical pathways involved in LPS sensing. So for example, the MAP kinase pathway. So we know that there are three key players of MAP kinases. One, one is the junk, the other is ERK, and the other is P38. Um, in the past, we know that if we, if we activate in the stimulated cells with high dose LPS, all these MAP kinases will be activated, followed by a, a, a rapid um, a decrease in the activation state. So there's transient activation followed by the deactivation. And then, so, but lately we, we found that if we, if we stimulate the cells with much lower dose endotoxin, for example, 50 picogram per mil uh, endotoxin uh, in vitro, we saw there's a clear decision-making differences uh, in terms of these activations. We saw a persistent activation of P-junk, P38, which is involved in cell stress um, uh, uh, pathways. In contrast, with p erg we saw a, a, a drastic reduction of p erg following, following the stimulation with 50 picogram per mil LPS compared with the, the, the residual phosphorylation of p erg uh, If we see that over a long time, for five days, we also saw a drastic uh, suppression of, of p erg instead of P38. Um, and then um, we, later on, we found that, um, um, that um, the, there's a, the, this competition of p erg and p junk most likely is mediated by um, the selective induction of MAC kinase phosphatases. So for example, the junk and P38, they can induce the erg selective M, uh, MAC kinase phosphatases. For example, MKP7 can de dephosphorate the erg, and erg can induce some um, P38 and junk selective uh, MAP kinase phosphatases that can dephosphorylate P38. So this is a mutually competitive circuit in the cells. We can only see that if we stimulate the cells with, with very low dose endotoxin that favors P38 and, and, and suppresses P erg and, and drive a pro-inflammatory stress response mediated reactions. Um, not only that, we also see a, a distinct natures of PAKTs. AKT is also involved in homeostasis, involved in repair, tissue repair, uh, the uh, anti-inflammatory reaction of a, a monocyte. With high dose endotoxin, we see an induction of AKT phosphorylation. Or with super low dose endotoxin, we see a suppression, drastic suppression of AKT phosphorylations. And not only that, we see uh, there's many other uh, more, uh, mutually competitive circuitry has been altered by the stimulation with, with super low dose endotoxin. In terms of transcription factors, we, uh, we looked at uh, the key M1 uh, transcription factor, IR5. If we stimulate the cells repetitively with very low dose endotoxin, we activate, we induce IRF5 protein levels. But with a very high dose LPS, with increasing dose of LPS, persistent stimulation, we start to see, uh, 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 we start to see this um, reduction of, uh, of IR5. Um, and in, in summary, so uh, we believe that there is a two distinct uh, programming dynamics if we treat, challenge the cells with either super low dose endotoxin or the high dose endotoxin, with a subclinical endotoxin, we preferentially suppress those suppressors 
this homeostatic suppressors, including ERK, uh, TOLIP, and PI3 kinases. And then we take the breakaway, allowing this uh, non-resolving inflammation to occur. With, in contrast, with, with higher dose endotoxin persistent stimulations, we start to initially, we drive NF-kappa-B, and then, and then the robust induction of NF-kappa-B and others can induce these negative regulators. And then that ne negative regulators come back as a, as a negative feedback and then cause tolerance and eventually exhaustion. Um, and then, um, so we, we believe that it happens at multiple levels and, and in the in integrative fashions. So, so the, we, we looked at, in particular, look at this uh, lysosome homeostasis. We found that if we challenge the cells repetitively with super low dose endotoxin, we drive apart the, um, the, the integration between the driver part of the communication between lysosome and, and autophagosome. And, and recently, we also found there's a disruption of communication between lysosome and peroxisome. And as a consequence, so you can see that with, with LPS stimulation, the, the fusion between um, lysosome and autophagosome, and lately with peroxisome, are disrupted. As a consequence, that allow the accumulation of intracellular ROS that further uh, amplify the stress signal inducing P38 and others uh, that driving the polarization of innate monocyte. Um, and indeed, we also saw that um, because of the disruption of lysosome fusion, we see the accumulation of P62. Uh, this P62 is also implicated, is involved in the further uh, activation of pro-inflammatory signaling paradigm downstream. And, and also we saw the accumulation of MLKL all involved in the disruption of lysosome fusion processes. And then, and then because of the disruption of lysosome fusion, it also accumulate uh, uh, IKK beta, uh, and then causing this uh, uh, slightly elevated phosphorylation of P65. Uh, just in summary, so we believe that there is a, within every single cell of monocyte, uh, uh, even neutrophils, there are multiple layers of mutually repetitive, mutually competitive circuit uh, happening at the molecular level and also at the subcellular organelle level. Um, and then because of this competition, uh, and then depending upon the signal strength and the competition level, they can drive the cells to one state versus the other. This is not, not only happening in innate monocyte macrophages, neutrophils, but also we believe that happens in other systems. So for example, in the T helper cells. Once the T cells, uh, the, uh, they become a mature T cell, and then undergo clonal expansion, they can further differentiate into helper cells. And that stage is similar to the innate memory establishment. So basically depend upon the cytokine environment rather than the TCR specificities. So, and then the, it, people realize that in order for the T helper cell to differentiate into either TH1 or TH2 or hybrid state, they need a mutually competitive circuit involving TBAT and GATA3, they compete with each other in the meantime, each of them will activate their own positive feedback loop. So you see a, a, the same signature happening that drive the clear decision-making of T helper cells. And not only in, in terms of uh, immune cell activation, if we further trace back to so the immune cell differentiation, we'll see the same signatures. So this is a, a classical review paper done by Rothenberg and others uh, in the early days. You see, if you see the differentiation between either the myeloid path, myeloid lineages or lymphoid lineages, we can simplify all those complex signaling pathways into two main arms. If the PO1 or the NOS signaling, they are mutually inhibiting with each other. And that mutual inhibition will, will, will make sure that we have a clear um, uh, differentiation into one branch or the other. When, the one, when one uh, factors win over the other branch, and then we have uh, either Different, clear differentiation of myeloid cells or the clear differentiation into the lymphoid cells. And likewise, this is another uh, classical review. Um, uh, we can see that even from the earlier HSC, step by step, we see this mutually competitive circuitry that, that, that allow this clear decision making into one branch versus the others. And of course, there'll be always a hybrid intermediate state. So from the HSCs to LMP, GMPs, and all the way to monocyte neutrophils, we can see these mutually competitive circuitries that define the differentiation state uh, of immune cells. 
Uh, we also modeled lately that this similar principle, this mutually inhibitory motif, uh, is a critical principle that, that uh, defines the clear decision making of immune cell differentiation and activations. And just to summarize what, we, uh, what I talked about in the, uh, in the last um, 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 30 minutes or so, we, we, we believe that the immune cells can develop unique memory state and they can recognize not only the, 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 the nature of the signal, but also the signal strengths and histories. And the reason we can, we can establish innate immune memory is because there is, there is dynamic motifs composed of these coupled positive feedbacks and mutually inhibitory feedbacks. And these are critically involved for the steady state decision-making process in generating distinct activation and uh, differentiation states. And those key motifs can happen at multiple levels. Uh, uh, it can happen in the cytosolic, cytosol, in the subcellular organelle levels, in the nucleus. Um, for example, there's uh, clear signals involved in uh, suppressors uh, or activators that remodel the chromatin. People call it epigenetic modeling. But if we, if, we, um, if we summarize them in terms of the motif, we can clearly see this mutually competitive motif happening at multiple levels. And our, our lab is trying to understand these competitions at multiple levels that drive the differentiation and activation of monocyte. And then we look at the receptor, uh, the, the adaptive molecules. We know that downstream of toll like receptors, there are, mutual, there are multiple adaptive molecules. For example, we have MYD88, we have TRAM and TRIF, and those two pathways, um, are in the past, people think those two pathways may be involved in uh, directing the traffic into uh, different type of uh, gene expressions. But we believe that there are more than that. So those, those two pathways actually are, are competing with each other. Right? So, they're, so we think that the TRAM pathway and the MID80 pathway, they, are, they also can, can form a mutually competitive motif. And that we, we, we collected evidence also support, supported by others that it's the TRAM that is, is primarily responsible for sensing superloaded endotoxin. So if we knock out MID88, we still see that the, 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 the programming of monocyte, mirroring monocyte by superloaded endotoxin, for example, 100 picogram per million LPS, we still see the, in, the induction of CCR5 or IL-12 by lower dose of endotoxin. And with high dose, we see the suppression, even in MID80 knockout. But if we knock out TRIF or TRAM, we basically read, uh, um, ablate that, that, that effect uh, by the superloaded endotoxin. So the TRAM is, is responsible for sensing the low-grade inflammatory um, signals from, from superloaded endotoxins. Um, and, and then this is also generally applicable to other agonists as well. Not only with TOL4 agonists, we also try TR7 agonists. We see similar adaptation. Again, if we, if we stimulate the cells, a uh, uh, murine monocyte for five days, if we challenge with very low dose TR7 agonist, we, we, we drive a, a priming state. If we increase the dosages of TR7 agonist, we drive a tolerant state. Uh, same thing with L12, we see the similar patterns. But if you look at arginase 1, the higher the TR7, the higher the arginase 1. Same with INOS, the higher the uh, TR7 agonist stimulations, the higher levels of INOS. Um, and then this is unique with TR3. We try the toll like receptor 3 agonist. If we, see a, if we try to educate and program the uh, murine monocyte repetitively with rising doses of TR3, we never can tolerate the cells. We start to keep on increasing CCR5, increasing IL-12, but not much of arginine 1. Um, and if you look at IR5 with uh, in increasing those of LPS, higher dose LPS, we start to see the suppression of IR5. Super low dose endotoxin, we see the increase of IR5. But in contrast, if we use TR3 agonist, we see the rising doses of TR3 stimulant, we see a rising uh, levels of IR5 in the cell. So this is clearly, there's a, the principle is that indeed, different agonists, uh, TR agonists can, can, can program the monocyte in different uh, dynamics different dynamics. Uh, just to summarize, we believe that there's a mutually competitive circuitries happening within the cell at multiple levels, at the adapter levels, at the signaling levels, at subcellular organelle levels, 
And even in the nucleus at the transcription factor levels, we can see these mutually suppresses, mutually competitive circuitries across different levels. And then, and then we can sense uh, the different signal strengths of TR4 agonist. Uh, as a consequence, the cells can be, uh, um, uh, can be trained and programmed into, into a diverse repertoire of activation state that permeate in, in our bodies so that can, they can be involved in, uh, res in responding to uh, unique challenges in the, in the cell. So, so, uh, so again, just to summarize it, uh, uh, so we believe that the signal strength dependent programming occurs at multiple levels. Um, and then we believe that MID88 and TRAM adapters are, are differentially involved in the decision-making process during the training process. Uh, and then as a consequence, we have, we, our body uh, can adopt, adopt um, a unique repertoire of, of innate immune memory cells. Um, and then the, the, the disruption of lysosomal fusion or biogenesis may serve as a key switch in the decision-making process as well. And then uh, I, um, uh, I'd like to talk about another unique adapter molecule in the uh, innate immune cell called TOLI. This is a less studied adapter molecule as compared with with uh, MID88 or TRAM. Uh, we first uh, found this molecule be able to bind with phospholipid in early 2000. Right? So, 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 and then this is the first example that, uh, that the toll like receptor intracellular adapter molecule can bind with phospholipid. Why that's important? Because we know that in order to direct the traffic, signal and traffic, we must, this adapter molecule must be able to bind with cell membrane. And the cell membrane is rich in lipid. So, and then different cell membrane contain different phospholipid. So that's why the, the, the main quality, the main uh, qualification for the adapter molecule is that it must be able to bind with lipid. So we were the first to demonstrate that the tolip is able to bind with phospholipid. As is shown here, the tolip molecule can bind with phosphatidylinositol lipid, either three or four, three, four, five phospho, phospholipid. And, and then uh, later on, Donaldson Kagan's group and others in Ruslan Mashtov's group found that MEL uh, can also bind with phospholipid. So the MEL is adapter for MID88, so they can bind different type of phospholipid. So, 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 and so and later on, we, we found that uh, TOLIP not only can bind with phospholipid, but also it can bind with cell membrane. And in particular, it localized to lysosome, uh, endosome, and autophagosome. Uh, and, and then um, later on, we found that TOLIP is incredibly Im important for facilitating the last step of uh, lysosome fusion. So, and then almost at the same time, another group in Europe found that TOLIP is involved in autophagy. But we, 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 uh, we have evidence showing that TOLIP is only involved in the final step of the fusion process, the fusion of lysosome uh, um, uh, with autophagosome or peroxisome. So without TOLIP, the, the fusion process will be, will be compromised. In the context, context of uh, monocyte programming, we found higher dose endotoxin uh, um, increases TOLIP, but lower dose, super low dose endotoxin actually reduces TOLIP level. And then that TOLIP serving, again, serving as a switch that can differentiate the signal strengths of LPS. Uh, and then we, we move on to some of the translational settings. So how, how does this innate immune memory state in, um, affect the the, the disease. So I quickly go through some of the examples um, uh, we collected in the past. So we, we first we looked at atherosclerosis. If we knock out tolip, if we either APOE single knockout or APOE tolip double knockout mice, we see that if we knock out tolip, we see a drastic increase of the of the of the plaques and also the oil oil uh, deposition within the plaque. There's a rap, the drastic increase the oil oil uh, staining uh, in terms of the oil staining um, um, areas, lipid depositions. Um, and then if, if we further look at not only in the aorta, aorta, but also in the liver, we see a massive infiltration, massive accumulation of lipid droplet. If, under, if we see that under the electron microscopy, we see this is a lipid droplet. Here is the lysosome. Um, in, in the APOE single knockout mice, we see the fusion of lysosome. We, sometimes we see the fusion of the lysosome with the lipid droplet. So that the lipid lysosome will basically get this uh, enzyme inside the lipid droplet. We can basically dissolve uh, the, the lipid. But here in the tolib double knockout, we see 
that even though they can juxtapose together, but there is never fusion. There's a clear division, clear separation of lipid droplet and the lysosome, uh, but they never fuse well. Uh, and if you further uh, stain for P62, uh, 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 this is in the, in the aorta. We saw that in the aorta, we saw a, a massive uh, accumulation of, of, of macrophage in the aorta with, uh, with the P62 positive monos macrophage in, um, in totally APOE double knockout, uh, knockout mice. And we also asked the question, okay, so what about if we challenge the mice with super low dose endotoxin repetitively uh, for, for, for two months? So we, we did it both for two months. We also did it for one month only. We saw that if we repetitively inject the mice with 100 picogram per meal, so this is a super low dose. So, so you, traditionally when people inject the mice with low dose endotoxin, they inject uh, 100 nanogram, sometimes one microgram per mouse. We only inject 100 picogram per, per mouse. Um, so if we inject it repetitively on a monthly, on a weekly basis for two months or even one month, we saw this uh, um, um, a massive increase in the lip lipid deposition areas. So increased lipid depositions. Not only so, if we look at the, this the necrosis area, we saw there's a drastic increase of these necrotic areas. So implicating that this, uh, this, uh, this plaque is highly unstable. So a drastic increase of these uh, necrotic areas. We further stain for collagen, there's a drastic reduction of uh, collagen uh, deposition within the, the, the plaque. So it's uh, so indicating, again, suggesting this is the superlotal endotoxin driver uh, unstable uh, plaque um, um, state. We also further look at the macrophage inside the plaque. We saw that, uh, also we saw this uh, increase of macrophage deposition within the plaque. Uh, we also look at the smooth muscle act, uh, actins. We see this uh, reduction of smooth muscle act, um, uh, um, um, uh, uh, smooth muscle cell deposition within the plaque as well. So, and then we further look at this uh, the balance between SRA and SRB. SRA uh, is a signature for this inflammatory uh, macrophage. Uh, SRB in, is, is, is the anti-inflammatory um, uh, macrophage markers. We see a, a drop uh, of SRB1 staining in the plaque and also increase of SRA um, in, the, in the plaque macrophages. We also did this systemic um, evaluations. Again, systemically, we saw that um, uh, uh, we see the peripheral blood uh, uh, in spleen, in bone marrow. Uh, we saw that mice injected repetitively with superlocal endotoxin. We see an increase of Lysic-C levels. Um, um, uh, we see also um, uh, increase of CCR5 and, uh, and reduction of SRB. Uh, also systemic inflammation, we saw increased TNF-alpha, IL-6, uh, uh, MCP-1, and also slight optic IL-10 as well. Uh, just in summary, we, we demonstrate that this non-resolving inflammatory programming happens in vivo so through a similar dynamics, um, that uh, these non-resolving monocytes are involved in the pathogenesis of uh, atherosclerosis. Um, how much time do I have, Jan? Uh, I, I think we should slowly um, wrap up. I, I, probably people uh, will run to their next meetings around uh, yeah, five here. So that's right. I let's think slowly wrap up and, and get a, a bit of time for, for questions also. That's, so that's right. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. I, I'll wrap up very quick. So within uh, two, two or three minutes. Perfect. So we also demonstrate that this not only happens in monocytes, but also happens in neutrophils. So we, we demonstrate that if we inject the LPS, superlocal endotoxin in mice, we also polarize neutrophils uh, in, in, in mice. So we basically we see this uh, uh, increased expression of uh, CD11B, actin 1, by reduction of uh, LRC32 FPNs uh, in neutrophils. And, and also, we can also say, demonstrate that if we just inject this ex vivo uh, program neutrophil with LPS into the mice, that will also be sufficient to drive this uh, um, uh, atherosclerosis uh, um, aggregation, uh, aggravations. And we also saw that uh, um, 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 if we, you, on the other hand, if we, if we, uh, we use a, a compound called for, uh, but, uh, PBA, it's a um, phenobutyric acid. It's a mimetic of uh, butyric acid. 
if we train the neutrophil with PBA, we can actually, um, um, okay. All right, so I think um, I may not have enough time to go through this because I, uh, so um, perhaps I'll just, uh, um, perhaps as, as, as a uh, stop here, because I have another story about that, about um, sepsis. So maybe you can just go through the sepsis story first. So, so we also have the acute septic story. So basically what we did was uh, we in, inject the mice with a, either with a super low dose LPS or the higher dose LPS first. After that, we did the sequel C- ligation punctures. So if we, if we do a um, super low dose LPS, we can actually exacerbate this sepsis mortality. But in contrast, we, we do a low dose LPS and then we can protect the mice from, 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 from septic shock. And likewise, we saw with the, with the low dose LPS, we see a, a tolerance in terms of TNF alpha expression, CXCL1 expression, but with super low dose, we see a priming in vivo. And then we look at the blood, we see this uh, with super low dose LPS uh, pre-incubation, we see actually a, 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 a increase in the, in the blood uh, uh, of, of, of bacteria um, after septic shock. Um, so, and then we look at the tissues as well. We saw that uh, with the uh, super low dose indoxin, we, we can uh, exacerbate the, uh, the, the septic mortality, multi-organ failures. So, so at the end, uh, I'd like to uh, appreciate all the people working in the lab. We have two research faculty members, uh, Gong Shuo and, and Zhang Yao. They are involved in, in the atherosclerosis work and the septic shock work and cancer. Uh, we have Allison, uh, a recent graduate student, and, and Kisa is involved in monocyte um, reprogramming. Richie is involved in neutral fields, and, and Zhu is involved in the computational dynamics uh, in the single cell sequencing analysis. And with that, uh, I'll take some questions. Thank you very much, Liu. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, this is obviously very interesting. While you were presenting, I was wondering. I mean, obviously, in vitro, you can play with the amount of LPS and then see what happens afterwards. But what I always wonder is how can we somehow profile what a cell saw in vivo? Because that's not just a, a, the level of one trigger, but a, a, a very com- yeah, mixture of, of, I don't know what. So how can we somehow translate this to an in vivo scenario? Can you give your, your idea about that? Maybe kind of future directions, how to approach this? Right, right, right. So, so it's indeed, so that's why I think the same thing happens with other stimulants. So, so in the in vivo, we can always, but, but even though there's high, high complexity of the um, monocytes in vivo, but we can see these signatures, right? We can, we can, if we sort the cells, we can start to see this, the, the ratio of, the, of those cells. So for example, if we, um, if we look at the, um, if you look at the chronic uh, inflammatory state in vivo, we see the, the ratio between, uh, for example, uh, the, the cells in a, in a prime state versus tolerant state. And then, uh, and, then, and then we can start to see which is the driving factor that affect that, that activation. So for example, if the, if the mice undergo uh, chronic uh, low grade inflammatory uh, LPS stimulations, and then the, the, the ratio of the cells demonstrating uh, certain, certain features will be much higher than the, other, than the others. On the yeah. other hand, if, um, for example, if we challenge them with high dose LPS or even with, um, with, with sepsis conditions in humans, we start to see uh, uh, monocyte po- populations with a distinct features coming up. And then and, uh, I think we, we, have to, we have to look at the ratios. And so, so that's why I think that also bear relevance in terms of the, the techniques we use to, to study. So conventionally, we use a knockout mice, for example. We certainly we knock out certain genes, either or, or overexpress certain genes. But I think we, we start to hear more more people, um, um, more group talking about that we, we cannot simply knock out certain genes in order to study the dynamics. We really have to um, uh, modulate the, the relative levels. Is it a rel- relative yeah. level of the genes instead of the complete knockout in, in order to study the functions? Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, yeah. In the scenario of a complete knockout, the, f- the cell somehow finds solutions which were probably not securing in, in real life. So that's right. But what you say, I think it's relevant because in the end, it's true. You see these hybrid states of, of monocytes, macrophages, which doesn't fit the M1 and M2. And 
I think it would be nice to get some kind of a feeling what the inducing factors or the stimulants were to get to a particular phenotype that you can mimic this better in vitro, not using LPS or IL-4 that people typically use, but the, the stimuli that are really driving the cells in vivo. So I, yeah, th these are the kind of things we struggle with or we try to imagine. Um, so that's the reason I, I was asking this. Right, so that's why we're trying, what I'm trying to do right, right now is to, we take a reference point. We use the in vitro program monocyte as a, as a reference point. And then we go to the literature or the other, uh, other translational studies, and then we map to see which, which will fit into certain populations. We see some, so believe it or not, we see some uh, interesting correlations. So we can see the signatures that uh, from, for example, from atherosclerosis or from sepsis, and then we see that uh, uh, that um, certain certain signature will be highly enriched in certain populations uh, compared with uh, with the in vitro stimulations. So there is two two questions related to LPS. One is whether you think the low levels uh, of LPS, for example, during IBD can can induce this low grade non resolving inflammation. Yeah, so that's what we believe that that, yeah. that is uh, that's basically this uh, superlodal's endotoxin levels that uh, because of the mucosal layer um, leakage that uh, they drive uh, this the state, um, this uh, low grade inflammatory state uh, that we start to see that not only in vitro but also in vivo as well. Yeah, and then one, one um, listener was maybe a bit confused by the, by the stimulation of one microgram of LPS inducing both inos and arginase. And this is things that, that we also see but there is still this belief that LPS drives INOS and not arginase, but maybe you should also comment on this. That, that's a great question, Jan, because, because this is, we, we think this is a fascinating competition because tr traditionally people think INOS and O is a, is a bad factor. But, um, but with high dose, we see that you, you I, I believe you'll see that too. You see that the, the, you see a, a, the drastic induction of INOS. And, and I, I believe that's a compensatory mechanism try, the system, system try to dampen because NO in many cases are suppressing inflammatory reactions. And NO can drive, for example, cyclic GMP pathways, drive, drive these uh, suppressed NF kappa Bs. And only when, so th that's the mechanism that the system try to, to amp up to suppress inflammatory reactions. But, but then, and then later on, NO, uh, if there's too much NO, NO can then get into together with ROS, become proxy nitrite, then it becomes, it becomes another story. But, but uh, NO is not simply just an a, a inflammatory stimulant. It can, can, in often case, can be anti-inflammatory as well. So that's the reason we believe that high dose will keep on inducing NO, uh, I, know. I to, to conclude, I will, I will ask just what I started with a question in, in the chat in the beginning of your presentation relating to COVID-19. I mean, obviously it takes time to get these specific vaccines. And I put the idea, okay, should we vaccinate everybody with BCG um, or not? And then I got some private comments on that. So I, I just leave it open as a question or as a point. And, and I, it would be nice to get your opinion on this. Obviously there are clinical trials going on. Um, should we wait for it or should we proceed? Or uh, I and the others look forward to this, to, to your idea on this, I think. Uh, this, is, this is another great question. So I think, again, uh, I think uh, we should clearly get a much better understanding of how these innate immune memory dyna dynamics occur and how that's been modulated. And then perhaps you can have a much better understanding of this innate immune memory dynamics. We can come up with a better system to, to intervene. We can calm down our immune system, calm down neutral monocyte, so, so a totally different, different aspect, perhaps not BCG, perhaps not LPS, but some other others that we can use to, uh, uh, to calm down our immune system. Um, and then in terms of BCG, and clearly, like I said, uh, I think BCG will clearly drive the monocyte into another, another prime, uh, prime state. Uh, but um, how that, uh, um, how that uh, tie into the story of COVID-19, uh, I'll leave that uh, <laughs> the judgment to others. Good. Thank you very much, Leo, for this uh, nice discussion and, and uh, presentation. So uh, thank, you. thank you all for watching. We have one more uh, presentation planned next week. It's related to this one, also trained uh, immunity. Uh, by This is the first time we will have a duo presentation by Niels Rixen and Mihai. One has 
positive consequences of the, the trained immunity, the one has uh, detrimental consequences. So I, I also look forward to this uh, duo presentation. Let's see how we organize it and how we, how we plan it. But this will be the, the last one uh, we schedule. And we now set a provisional date for the real uh, Immunomednet seminar again, which will be November 13th. So fingers crossed that we will be allowed and, and uh, able to organize it, but that is now uh, set as a potential date. So meanwhile, thanks again, uh, Leo, for this nice presentation. And I look forward to see you all next week for the, for the last time for now uh, on these uh, online seminars. Thank so, you very much. Thank you, thank you everyone also. Bye. Bye.